Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by Cheshire Impact, on a mission to help people maximize their use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. And we're live. So exciting. Ah, it's my favorite thing in the morning is to meet someone who has all these magical powers in the marketing world and learn from them. And today's guest is exactly that. Let me give you the clues and see if you can guess. A B2B marketing professional, professional, a consultant, a coach. Some have even said an online industry pioneer. I've been doing this for close to 30 years, if not more now. <laughs> no, we can't. No, uh, for only a few years. <laughs> um, also uh, created a docu uh, documentary uh, that we're going to talk about and what the process is like that, uh, for that. Um, uh, has been on the CBS morning show, the Today Show. Famous, famous connector of peoples and ideas, CEO, marketing strategist of the Scandora Group, Jane Scandora. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Casey. Man, I almost lost myself in your introduction. <laughs> too many things, too many things. Too many things. We're talking about that. We, we all have all these different passions. We like doing this and that and this and that. Yeah, that happens uh, when you're old, too. You know, you have a lot more to talk about. <laughs> you have a lot more experiences to think about, too. It's like, well, I did scuba diving, and I'm going to do this other thing. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So the theme for today, uh, marketing strategy, community, um, marketing as a community, uh, getting more than just yourself involved, how to you leverage that network effect. Uh, I, I can't wait to learn from you. And so here we go. I'm going to pick this. This is heavy, but okay. be careful. This is Thor's hammer. All right. Got it. So take that hammer and, and smash for me some kind of marketing myth, some bogus strategy you've heard that you're just like, this is ridiculous and you can't stop talking about it. Okay, that's what I deal with all the time and what I do, yeah. <laughs> and it is that you talk to companies and they say an employee advocacy program will not work for our company. They just say just flat out doesn't work. No, no, for a lot of different reasons. If you know what employee advocacy is, it's just engaging and activating your employees to, to spread your marketing messages, to be a, an advocate for your company and what you do and why you're a great company to work with and whatnot. And there's a lot of a lot of pushback that I get. Number one is, you know, it's too risky. I can't just let out my my employees to go share on social media all their, <laughs> their thoughts, right? Um, also, that employees have no incentive to do it. Why would I want it? And I hear this a lot. Why should I use my network to talk about Ooh, the company? Interesting. This is, a, this is a network that I built on my own. Why should I right. really use that for company purposes? Right. Also, you know, they also say, how do you measure it? And there are so many ways to measure it. I mean, that's a classic question that we get in social media all the time, right? How do you measure it? But there are direct uh, opportunities to do that. No, so I, I would say, yes, I agree with all that if you do it wrong. Right? <laughs> right, right. So if you do it wrong, you're correct. This is not a good program, but done right, it sounds like this is a myth. It yep. actually is mega successful. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we all know that, that people uh, trust people like themselves more than they trust media or right. or company propaganda Corporate. So, right yeah. exactly so if your employees are sharing messages or talking about your company in a positive way it's proven that they get shared 24 times more what than a than a company message coming directly from the company man I mean, I just want to settle <laughs> down with that. yeah are you yeah. kidding me 24 times more i mean the the, the stats vary but i mean when you think yeah. about it we're all consumers right so you're always looking for recommendations and who do you trust? Do I do I go to the to the to the restaurant? No, I, I look at other people's right. reviews. So yeah. the same thing is happening in B two B. They're asking their peers. They're looking for other people, real people, just like them, to give them advice. Yeah, and we're so cynical these days. We go see some <laughs> fake reviews. We're like, ah, you know, I I had um, someone stay at a a B and B and. They didn't have a good experience, but all these reviews were like, oh, best place ever. And it's like, hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're right. It's the people we trust, the people in our, our network that we want right. to know from more than anybody. So, right. And if your employees are not your biggest fans, you've got a big problem. <laughs> right? That is also a good point. <laughs> exactly. I, I suppose when you're, and you're helping people do set these things up as well, yeah. I, yes. I, bet, I bet there's all levels of like 
it goes deep when you're like, uh, nobody really likes you or like all these different things that happen, um, yep. that get in the way. But okay. So I love that list you had earlier. So too risky. Let's talk about that. Uh, actually, actually, before we do that, um, <clears throat> I love how you said activating your employees. So, so just kind of define this thing an employee uh, advocacy. advocacy. You call it employee activation and employee, employee advocacy. Activation. Um, you, you know, and it's also kind of a, a, an issue, which is who leads this? Because this is more of a company wide. I deal mostly with uh, marketing and sales executives uh, because they know that social selling and engaging their subject matter experts, so the product managers, the engineers, those people that know so yeah. much about the company to activate them and get them out there on social media to share, they know the benefits of getting the word out. But you know, this is also an issue for HR. How do you onboard? you know, your, your employees to, to help them become more of a, a good corporate citizen. Um, I think the problems with regard to too risky is they, they think, well, first of all, a lot of companies don't allow their, um, their employees to even access social media in the company, right? They block those sites. What is this? 2001? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. A lot of times it's, it's mostly regulated, a lot of highly regulated kind of companies. That's true. You know, whether it be healthcare, finance. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, I work with, with Merrill Lynch, and boy, they have so many restrictions. Even what they can do in their, their own personal LinkedIn profile. They can't even say much about what they do in their LinkedIn profiles. So there's a lot of restrictions regarding, uh, you know, not getting in trouble from any kind of regulators. So that's understandable, but there are definitely ways around. It's not a reason not to do it. True. Uh, and there's industries other than those industries. Too. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And also just, you know, just letting your employees loose without training them on how to be responsible is a recipe for failure. I have one um, example where, um, you know, millennials are, are very free with their language, right? Uh, and <laughs> and somebody uh, chose to say something about um, a corporate initiative that it was exciting AF, right? And we all know what AF means, right? If you don't Google it. All yeah. right. Yeah. I'm not going to say it here. It's for not Air Force. Family, family time here. Um, so you say, you don't say that. In, in well, this is the hardcore marketing show. So kids should be in bed. <laughs> you could say it. <laughs> you know, the urban dictionary is the first thing that comes up when you Google AF. It's not the air force and it's not <laughs> atrial fib, uh, fibrillation. It's something else. But yeah, go, go look it up everyone. If you don't know. Yeah, exactly. Let's give them a to-do list. Okay. Yeah. So, so you say something like that in a yeah. very, um, reserved kind of an industry and they think it's cool and exciting. And hey, it's an exciting AF. And they're like, wait a minute, you're pissing off you know, some, some very traditional types of customers. So you have oh. to be careful what you're saying. You know, I was kind of excited out. about that. It, you know, if you think about it, if, if one of your younger employees is saying that, right. that's actually a compliment, right? Exactly. You're saying, man, exactly. I'm excited as this, yes. this yes. level about this program. So to go to kind of like beat them up over it, it may be just a little more wrangling. Like, eh, you know, it was good, but let's, how can we better repurpose this? Exactly. You know, there's other ways to say it or there are other, you know, you have to just consider the, the recipient because if it's a, a traditional type of business, right? Mm. You know, again, it's just rules. Rules and If you don't have any policies, then, then you really have no recourse. True. And I think it reflects on the culture of the company too. Like yes. if, if that's established and um, like, like at, at Cheshire, it's we care, we have fun, we get things done. So as long as you're not violating that, then yep. go to town. Yeah. Whereas if you're maybe some, you know, some suited tie wearing, you know, and, and your core values are like professionalism and something, something, then maybe that would be a violation. Um, yeah, but I think this medical, this is what medical diagnostics companies. So oh, it's, was it, oh you know, really? It's, it's so it's, it's a little, again, this was something that I had, uh, it was a, a, a colleague of mine that had dealt with this and right. I had, how do I deal with, you know, these, what she do? Well, you know, you just have to coach them, right? And, yeah. and you have to advise them the right way to, to address, you know, here's our audience. Here's what they care about. Here's how yeah. they communicate. Here's what they want to be communicated to. So I don't think it's a bad thing if you're, if you're dealing in a B2C or, or something that is relatable to that type of language. But again, yeah. that's just an example, you know, off the cuff. No, it's um, a great example. It, yeah. you know, these are ju like juicy stories. So yeah. Um, yeah. Apparently that medical device company was, was cool AF or, or maybe not. Right, what, right. what other things keep up into the sort of untrained? Right, well, not, not everybody's going to do it too, right? right? So not everyone is inclined to be a social media advocate and you want it to be natural. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're sharing very technical information and I am a, 
an admin or something, for me to share something that's a very technical document or a white paper, it's not authentic to me. Right? Right. So, so, so you want to be able to guide them, which is why training, which is what I do, is something that's very important uh, for them right. to be authentic and feel comfortable in sharing and uh, not worry about getting in trouble or whatever. So, you know, that's a really good point. And I love how we're working down your list too. The first thing it was like too risky and you're like, look, you got to do training. These things can happen, but not only do you do training, but you establish some, some guidelines in the first place. So you're not necessarily dealing with things after the fact. Right. And the second thing you mentioned was no incentive and or not inclined and you got to be authentic. How do you, how do you do that? How do you balance those? Well, you know, and this is one area that I think companies truly miss in terms yeah. of thinking that the employees are not going to do this or not going to be incented because it's how they're positioning it is from the inside out and from the company point of view. And if you're trying to, to create enthusiastic, excited employees about what you do, you need to have it work for them. So what's in it for me as the employee, if I'm sharing out there in social media and I'm, I'm engaging, I'm building my personal brand. I am, I am showing that I am a thought leader. I'm showing that uh, you know, I have career aspirations in this area, that I am knowledgeable in this area. And I don't think many companies, just what I focus on is com- focus on the employee first. What's their brand? You know, what, kind of, what kind of contributions can they make? How, do they, how, do they, how does this help them in their career and get noticed with the right people to get promotions? Or you know, from the uh, employee's point of view, you're not gonna be at this company forever. So, you know, out of sight, out of mind has never been truer than it is today. So right. you, you want to be out there to show what you know. I like that. How does this help you in your career? Thinking about them. So yep. again, good marketing, whether you think, whether it's with customers or your team, it's, it's yep. not about you. It's about your people. So giving them that messaging of this helps your career out to share it. I guess you have that good content. You have to have good things to share too. Cause yeah. you yeah. doesn't feel authentic to share like garbage. No, it's true. And, you know, I work with um, Cisco, which is one of my favorite clients. And, the food and or the tech? No, the tech. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, tech is my background, right? So I, I work with yeah, a lot yeah. of tech companies. And, uh, you know, I, I find they, they do a fabulous job. If anybody wants to just Google, just Google Cisco and social ambassadors, and they do a fabulous job in enabling their and empowering their employees to, to present on, on the company behalf. They have, um, I mean, I train their sales and the marketing teams and their executives who don't, want to ask stupid questions or don't want to admit they don't know how to really engage to be a thought leader in social media. So I do one-on-ones with them. But uh, there was an example, a great example, and they empowered this person or just people in general. Uh, they, did, they do an, an annual event, uh, uh, a big Cisco event for partners and customers and whatever. And this one person did a, a video uh, to the song Happy by Pharrell. <laughs> and all she did was so. take her camera her, her phone and, and videotaped all her colleagues setting up uh, the event and all the things that they were doing behind the scenes. And they're all dancing and they're, they're you know, lip syncing to the song. And this thing went viral. And what does it show? It shows that they love to work for this company, that they couldn't wait to get to this event. And you know, events are no fun <laughs> to put together most of the time, right? They're tedious and they're very hard to do. But it presents a culture that's, that's exciting and that people want to work for. Yeah, I like that. Right, which, help, which helps with recruitment. You see something like that. It's like, wow, I want to work there. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of picturing that like dancing happy movie. And then it's like, hey, we have a good time. It's great for recruiting, but it's also fun for them to just film. Yep, exactly. Rather than squashing that. And you know, good for Cisco not squashing that. Sometimes you can think a big tech firm going to be all serious. Yeah. And uh, squash, you know, all fun must cease until morale improves, you know, like that kind of attitude. Yeah. And, you, and, you, and employees want to work and more, more so these days for companies that have a purpose, right? And, uh, and again, I, I hate to keep using Cisco, but they just do such a wonderful job. You know, they do a lot for women's initiatives. I've been a speaker on their uh, Women of Impact event. They have a global event every year, every March around International Women's Day. And they bring people together all around the world in local locations to talk about empowerment of women and whatnot. And, um, you know, this goes around the world and this shows people what kind of a company that Cisco is, right? So you don't have to, you don't have to jam a, a sales pitch for routers down people's throats, <laughs> right? You know, people want to work for a company that, ha- that has a purpose too. Right. That's a really good point. But I guess if, you, if you're selling routers, how do you have a purpose? 
What do you mean? No, I'm just that they, in addition to, in mm. addition to, right, they're, they're also not just focused on just selling stuff to you, but they're also engaged in their community. They're engaged in other social issues, which is just as important as creating a, a reputation to attract customers, to attract employees. Right? Got it. So use that social outreach with, with yeah. a purpose. So exactly. the outreach has a purpose too. Exactly. It makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So too risky. Let's get some training. No incentive. Be authentic. Talk to them about how it helps them. Empower them. Open up the doors. Let them sing their happy song. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think yeah. it was Wisty. I'm not sure which. Uh, no, maybe it was someone else. Um, might have been Drift. Might have been Drift, actually. Um, they announced some big thing on their product, and then all 100 people in the company all shared a video on LinkedIn in their yeah. own words about what happened. I was That's truly it. impressed. Yeah. I'm like, how did you get 100 people? And like developers or people that don't want to talk to people yeah. did it too. Everyone yeah. did it. And I was like, right. wow. That is a perfect example of employee advocacy. And, and it's not something that you can force people to do. You know, you're gonna have your natural, natural- You can't force them to do it? <laughs> huh? You can't force them to do it? You can, but it's not gonna work. It doesn't work, <laughs> or, does it? Yeah, but uh, you know, Drift is a great example too. I met, I met those guys over at the uh, B2B Marketing Exchange Conference uh, last month, and, and they, do, they, have, they generate a lot of excitement. And uh, we took a selfie with them, uh, and, uh, you know, shared it on Twitter and whatnot, because they're like, oh, if you share this, we'll enter you into, so it's, it's a lot of those kinds of things of engaging, yeah. activating your ecosystem. Yeah. Like marketing shouldn't be the only people that are responsible for doing this. It's everybody's job to market. So on back to the incentive, because I feel like this is, yeah. this is probably a hang up. Um, if you get over the risk and we're going to talk about measuring it in a second, but the incentive, mm-hmm. Connecting it to their careers as thought leadership is—is is there anything else? It, what if people just don't care, or they don't? They're not. To your point, they're not inclined. Right. I'm right. not a that social creature. Yep. I mean, again, you're not going to get everybody. Right. And uh, and that—that's the point. What you want to do? It's just—it's the eighty twenty rule all over, right? So you you, right. you it's you want to engage the most likely ones i mean you can pick them out i mean most people are sharing anyway i mean people talk about their companies in general uh but why not formalize it in a program but if you're not going to do it you're not going to do it i i you know like i said i train these people they're in this class they're in the they're in the program yeah okay but but they don't really carry on Mm -hmm. Uh, some people are good to just go collect a paycheck and go home so you're not going to reach those people but there's plenty more okay so don't don't go crazy if you don't get everybody no, absolutely not. But you know what? I'll tell you what I found in my experience in working with companies like this. When those that don't want to do it see those that are doing it and are getting the benefit from it, they're like, hmm, you're <laughs> doing this. Right? Right. What are the benefits for that team member that is doing these things? We, we said it's good for thought leadership. Visibility. Visibility. <laughs> Uh, if you know that we live in and you and I've talked about this we live in an attention economy where your competition is not just people like you but it's also cat videos and <laughs> news, right I mean you, you, you can't get people's attention anymore so the only way to get it is to attract it because you're worth worth the attention so 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 putting your personal brand together and having a, a something that's worthy to talk about if you're interested in advancing your career you really do have to put yourself out there or have people know within the company what you do and the value you deliver. I also talk to companies about team brands and how do you align personal brands with team brands that are in alignment with the company brands because once everybody's marching in the same formation, then it all works. Right. Yeah, that's cool. But uh, you're going to get people that don't want to do it. You know? True. True. But it, it, like I said, 80, 20 rules. Don't, you know, don't worry about that. Um, let's talk about uh, okay, let's talk about measuring it. Then I would love to get to attention economy too, because that'd yeah. be cool to talk about. So, how do you measure this? Does it have an effect? Can you calculate an ROI? Oh, absolutely. So, cool. so there are a lot of tools that uh, you know you could do this in a very informal. For smaller companies, is more informal ways to implement this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but for bigger companies, you have tools like you know the Sprout Socials, the Dynamic Signals, you know the Elevates, those things where you can see what's being shared by who. Who's engaging with it? What's being driven back, you know, with, with calls to action, right? What's going back to your uh, website? 
social selling, there's plenty of, of, of opportunity. I mean, that's, that's a form of employee advocacy, although it's part of their job, right, to sell. Um, but there's plenty of, of ways to be able to, to attract that. And Salesforce, if you're in a Salesforce position, you could be logging those types of uh, new contacts or new engagements that are being brought through through social media. Right. You know, I suppose, yeah, as you're logging it, you're capturing it, you know, marketing automation too, um, you're going to see an uptick. It's probably what you're looking for. I, I guess at the basic level, you'll see an uptick in social, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. social yeah. go up, maybe blog posts, organic traffic will go up. Yep. So you'll start seeing some ROI on those platforms increase. Um, do some of these tools have the ability to know that Casey is on the team and shared this? Oh, sure. No, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes, because you, you'll load up, you know, you have your own content that you want to be shared. Yeah. Uh, that you want the employees to put their spin on it, not just take it and share it. So Ooh, if the like CEO does a, does a video, and, and I'm, I'm kind of, this is one of my biggest pet peeves when I go through this with my students, is like, you know, when somebody puts up a video, your marketing CMO puts up a marketing video, don't everybody just share it as it is. Put your own perspective on it. Put your own spin on it. Uh, you know, if they're talking for two minutes, there are probably 20 different nuggets within that video that you can call out to your audience to be able to address, right? Um, here's an example. I have one executive who was an introvert uh, and very uh, not very active on uh, social media, uh, wants to be a Twitter star. She says, I want to be a Twitter star. I said, well, why? <laughs> and she said, well, I want to be known as a marketing technology guru. I said, great. So work with her to, to uh, put together a brand and to be out there and sharing. She had, she embraced it. Like I can't believe, and she's my biggest cheerleader and I adore her. Um, featured in Forbes uh, magazine, wow. TEDx, uh, you know, recruited speakers for, for, for the company. So there is absolutely value of putting yourself out there and driving thought leadership, which then brings attention to not only you, but to your company. You know, networking, being able to network and find new opportunities through that. Wow, and you helped her do that. Yeah, it's I, I, it just it's one of my. That's a great story. Great, yeah. Who, yeah, you know, what, what, you know, what marketing leader out there is not hearing that going like, yeah, I like that too, and it starts with thought leadership. But I, I also like to put your spin on it. That's really important. I think there's something freeing about that too. You don't just have to trumpet the same old phrase. It's probably why um, Drift didn't say you must state this in your video it's like this is what's happening go tell the world and just allowing people to have their own kind of video that doesn't mean they're gonna be perfect videos but that's that's good i think sometimes the perfection makes it less authentic yes absolutely absolutely and it's and if you're just sharing one thing and just everybody share that's spam that's broadcasting and, yeah. and the, the whole by definition social media is engagement it's two-way two -way. and you don't want to be just spamming people it's all about engaging all about engagement. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you know, allowing them to to put their two cents in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I really yeah. like that. Yeah. Because I, that, I think that helps open up. There's some people that just aren't inclined, but there are other people that are like, yeah, but I think something, this other thing, great. Like put your spin on it, get that message out. But also that's how you become a thought leader is like you start saying, what is and what isn't right smash your own myths on your own twitter account kind of thing yeah and and, cool. and be a little controversial not controversial to an to an extreme but take a take an alternative point of view just to get the conversation going you know right. ask an open-ended question i tell people ask an open-ended question when you share something so someone will respond from a from a perspective of gathering intelligence about what your customers want and need or what their pain points are there's it's, there's a wealth of information that can be gathered through social engagement and a human to human basis. Right. right. Which then could be fed into a data analysis and see how uh, it yeah. of course, and then automate the, 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 the crap out of it. So, you Get know, those guys, gals come in and do all their data crunching and right. But at the, but the very beginning, it's that human aspect, being authentic, putting your spin on it. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. And I can see that that makes it more fun to do too. Sure. You know, sure. Messenger. Yeah. You don't want it to be a chore. You want it to be something that, that they find enjoyable. I mean, if they're working for this company, they should be enjoying what they're doing right. and showing off that they are an expert in whatever that is. Yeah, and if not, get a new job, people. Come on. Yeah, and, you know, and it doesn't always have to be company stuff. I worked with an executive at um, IBM and uh, set him up on Twitter, and, uh, and I said, you know, what do you like to do personally? 
And he said, well, I'm a Formula One fan. I'm a Yankee fan. I said, put that in your Twitter profile. Oh, yes, Yankee. Yeah, no, what? <laughs> what <laughs> Red Yankee? Sox all the way. Come <laughs> on, people. New Yorker. <laughs> oh, yeah? You're a Yankees fan too? Yeah, I grew oh, up this interview. This interview is done. <laughs> We're all done here. <laughs> we'll have to communicate during the season. Even wearing red today. I mean, that's amazing, right? Uh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. But anyway, so he's a Yankee fan. He was a Formula okay. One fan. I said, put that in your Twitter profile. He yes. said, yeah, but I'm going to just talk about IBM stuff. I said, just put it in your profile. Because no one wants to talk to just a monolithic corporate voice. <laughs> right? 100%. Within a, right. Within a week, he got a tweet from an executive over in Europe, another IBM executive who did not know that he was a Formula One fan. He said, oh, my God, we have a client here that is totally engaged with Formula One. We need you to come over here and help with this engagement. Oh, my gosh. So you don't know what that, yeah. that connection might be to help with driving business. You know, I can see it now. They're like, hey, we, need, we, we don't know Formula One. We don't want to BS the customer. Right. But you're a fan. You get in there. You, you guys will talk, you know, talk shop for two hours talking about this driver and that driver and that race and have that hairpin turn. The client will be like, man, you guys are the best. I'm signing with IBM today, you know. Exactly. And, and they might even invite you to the to, – you join them at the next race in Monte Carlo or something Yeah, uh, that all came from just put a little more of your personal self out there. And at the yeah. start of the story, when you're telling it, it was like, uh Oh, boring executive at IBM. Like what's going to happen? I, I used know. to work for one and then, it, but, but to find out, Hey, formula one and what else you said, formula one and something else. Yankees. <laughs> oh, I already, I already forgot that part. <laughs> uh, formula one and sports teams. <laughs> here's, here's another myth that, that ties into this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, is, yeah, um, sure is that um, no reason to maintain relationships with former employees. Interesting. So, so uh, after, because I, I worked for IBM for 11 years, after I left IBM, I actually went, went back as a consultant to IBM for a while, and I worked on their corporate alumni program, which was uh, a, a program to connect current and former IBMers to network. And my job was to activate the global sales and marketing teams to identify and engage with former IBMers who are now IT decision makers in other companies. Yeah, imagine right? that. Low hanging fruit. Hey, you worked at IBM, I worked at IBM. Hey, isn't this great? You know, within, I, I was on a call presenting this program to a bunch of salespeople and one very smart salesperson, while I was still talking, went on LinkedIn, he had a, a sales um, call with a company that IBM had no relationship with. And he looked up on LinkedIn and he saw that there was a former IBMer that worked there. Huh. So he sent him a note, hey, I'd like to get together with you. They connected, they, they whatever. And within six months, they closed the deal. And wow. he said it was directly related to the IBMer being in that account. Right, interesting, that's really cool. Right, so you don't think that everybody leaves and you know maybe they've left on, on bad terms or they were whatever, people still, have an affinity. I, I don't know, maybe it's, IBMers are somewhat different. We, we, we're just like a cult sometimes, you know. Um, but you work uh, there too? Yes, I worked there for okay. 11 years. We'll have to get into that cult then at yeah. some point. Okay. No, it's just that you, you just trust you just trust people from IBM. I don't know what it is. It's just we have a bond. There's a bond that, that has been built. Uh, but, but this guy was able to close a deal. And, and, and there, was, there was actually a lot of opportunities. You know, again, as I created this program, more salespeople, more client execs uh, were able to connect with former IBMers. And they realized, regardless of how you left the company, there's a certain level of affinity uh, for the products and services that you worked on. True, true, unless you got mega burned. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Otherwise, if, if everyone was on the up and up, then yeah, it... it I guess it's, it's cool to get over that awkwardness because sometimes it can be kind of weird and, uh, you know. Well, and it's also an opportunity for the, for the companies to do the right thing when people leave, regardless yeah. of how they leave. Because you just don't know where they're going to end up. You know, so true. I, 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 get, I get emails and letters from my college all the time saying, hey, give us money. And I thought, you know what? Perhaps you should have treated me like an alumni when I was still a student. Because I'm like, I'm not going to give you a penny. You guys are crazy, you know? So um, that's a great point, you know, knowing that there's this power to the alumni, um, yes. you know, treating people res with respect and, um, and yeah, and if, and if it goes well, just honor that and kind of keep the relationship going. I'd love to do that personally because, uh, you know, there's so many people I've, I've worked with in the past that I'd love to keep, keep up with, you know? Exactly. And, and your point about the alumni with your college, I am on the board of my high school 
alumni. Okay. And I started a technology chapter for professional uh, technology people. Hmm. And you know, the motto for our school, very tight knit high school in, in Queens, New York, and um, the largest Catholic high school in the country, matter oh, of fact. Oh, cool. Really? And, largest? How the largest? large? Non, uh, well, my, I think, I don't know now, but my graduating class many, many moons ago was close to 700. Jeez. I mean, what was yeah. it called? St. Francis Prep. St. Francis Prep. Alumni? Do you want to know about alumni? Joe Torrey from the Mets is an alum. Whoa. Um, Vince Lombardi, the, the legendary coach. He is an alum of my high school. Judy, Julie Chen from CBS, big brother. She's an alum. Um, but anyway, so, so uh, we keep in touch. And our, the motto is basically high school is four years, but the prep is forever. And so they have really maintained uh, a very tight-knit um, uh, community where people do donate and people do get together and they, they, they help each other out. Sounds good. That is cool. You know, I, I was doing that myself. Um, went to a much tinier private school and uh, high school. It was a good experience, though. Um, I mean, high school, you know, school for me in general is just not, not so good. But I think the people and, um, and looking them up now afterward on LinkedIn, and we have a little alumni group, and just looking through the members of that, you're like, wow. Yeah. And how, how many of us have ended up in marketing? And I sent a few of them notes just like, hey, BG, you know, I went to Bishop Garden. So I was like, hey, B, you know, fellow BG alum here, also a marketer, just want to connect, you know? Absolutely. So. Sorry, I get spam calls all the time. Oh, uh, blame <laughs> the spammers. No worries. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, that, that's funny how that, that alumni effect can be really cool. Yeah. Just go ahead. You know, do you know that on LinkedIn you have the opportunity to really do some, ana- some finding of alums? There's a, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a feature that not too many people know about. Yeah, talk about it. So if you um, if you go to any profile and they have uh, their um, their high school or their college listed in their profile, just click on it. It's hyperlinked and it'll take you up into a to a feature where you can see uh, people you know who graduated, where they work now, where they live now, and you can sort it. And I mean, people get lost in that feature on LinkedIn. Be able to connect with people that they you know didn't know that they uh, were on LinkedIn. Good. So to do that, make sure you have your college and even your high school added in yep. uh, to your education section on LinkedIn. That is a really good point. Mm-hmm. So you go down to it and you just click on it and it shows you everybody else yep. there too. That's really cool. Yeah, it is really cool. Yeah. There you go. Click on BG and, and then it's like, oh, it shows they're, they're hiring. No, thanks. Show me the people. <laughs> Let's see here. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. And the sorting, I mean, you just sort it by location, by job title, by, I mean, it's a business development, you know, gold mine too. Oh yeah. And I clicked on, then there's a whole alumni category. Let's see. There are, for mine, at least over 1,378 alumni. There you go. That's cool. See all. And then you can oh. change the, uh, the dates of when they, you know, you want to see only people that graduated this year or, uh, you know, so you can change oh, it. Oh, you're right. Well, I could change it to my year and see what happens. <laughs> But from a social selling perspective, in common bonds, right? It's that Formula One, it's that Yankees, it's the high school. So anything in the LinkedIn profiles is, is searchable. It's, it's, it's hyperlinked. So you can now find even, you know, charities. If a, if a, a potential prospect is involved in a potential char- a prospect of charity, you know, there's another point to talk about. <clears throat> right, right. I just put in my, my year to my year to kind of restrict it. And sure enough, there's all my, all my old peeps. <laughs> That's great. There's 35 of them. 35. Are you connected with all of them? No. There you go. <laughs> you, will like today. you will by the end of the day, right? Three of them out of 35. I got some work to do here. There you um, go. Yeah, look at that. That's really cool. I recommend everyone you know, goes, goes and does this. And of course, you might not recognize people from their yeah. names if they've gotten married or whatnot. But, but um, I do this you know, through my, my, my training. And you know, when I bring up this feature... I feel like I've lost everybody for about 10 minutes. I'm like, okay, come back, come back, because I know you're like searching for your classmates. Stop you're right. right. <laughs> yes, what are you doing right now? <laughs> wait, wait, are we doing a podcast? What are we doing? Is this yeah. a phone call? <laughs> I'm totally out. Of, yeah, yeah, I'm like, click, click, connect, connect. So anyways, I'll make it to do to, to go back and do that. You're just proving my point there, Casey. Yeah, and I think this, this overall thing we're talking about is like, you know, when we were explaining it earlier, you're saying it's not just your team or your – Alumni, it's that community at large, using your whole community uh, to do your networking. Yeah, and, and, you know, my th- and I have a story to tell, but the, my, my point would be like, pick your head up out of your cell phones 
as you're walking along and you never know who you're going to connect with. Okay. Yeah. So I have to tell you this story. So back in yes, this is the 20, story, right? The story I've been wanting to tell you. So back in 2010, <laughs> <clears throat> I was walking through Grand Central. Okay. And this was before the whole social media explosion, and before even smartphones, pretty much. I mean, the smartphones were out there, but not to the extent we have now. And I saw this guy, and I'm going to show you a picture on my iPad. Cool. So anyone that is doing video can see this too. Yep. Yes, I want everybody to see this. So, so I walked by this guy, and he's holding up a sandwich board. Tell me if you can see it. Yeah, a little bit closer, and I'll even read it to people. So it says, guy is in a suit, looking, looking mm -hmm. dapper. George yeah. Washington University grad. I speak Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, English. I need a job. Wow. So this was in the height of the financial crisis, right? So this guy was looking for a job. He had trouble finding a job, whatever. He goes out with a sandwich board. And I thought that was the funniest thing and just the, the most chutzpah and just yeah. such a nerve. I said, I shook his hand. I said, like, you are one kick-ass kid. You are going to wind up no problem in a good job. Give me your resume. He just ran out of resumes. I said, all right, let me he take a picture. Out. What, people kept he asking out. for him? Yes. For I said, him. let me take a picture of you. So I took a picture of this picture. I said, I'm going to post it on Facebook. This was before LinkedIn gave you the opportunity to post pictures. So I would have done it on LinkedIn. So I shared it on Facebook. I said, hey. You know, give this guy, send him an email. Here's his email. Just, just wish him good luck. If you have an opportunity, blah, 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 blah. And that was the end of it. Everybody got a good laugh. What a great, what a great shtick. Now, if you're on Facebook, you know that you get your memories pop up over the right. year. Yep. So a memory popped up with my post of this guy. And I said, I wonder what ever happened to him. Because yeah. I saw his name was in there. Yeah. So I went to LinkedIn and I Googled him. And the guy works at Google. Okay, so I think he landed pretty well. Hey. Okay? Well, Not that, only that. that. Makes total sense. I mean, he speaks more languages than I can fathom. Right? So th what I did is I actually sent him an email. I said, hey, you probably don't remember me, but I want you to have this picture to show how far you've come into what you did. And I was so impressed with your chutzpah. It was great to meet you. It's a blast from your past, blah, blah, blah. Within five minutes, I got a call, uh, an email back from him. It said, and he lives in California, by the way, and I'm in New York. Okay, he right. lives in California. And he said, "Oh, thank you so much for being so kind to me back then. I, I remember. And you know, if if you, it's hard to believe this, but I married a woman who grew up right where I live, like a mile from where I live right now. And I'm going to be in the area this weekend. I would love to buy you a cup of coffee and thank you for being so kind to me." What? So what are the chances of oh, him man. being in New York three days after I sent him an email that he married a woman whose family still lives here? So he and I met and we uh, got together for coffee and he is the greatest. I have taken a personal interest in his success now. I mean, he is just the greatest guy and, um, you know, lessons learned. Serendipity is amazing. Yeah. Right. You know, meaningful coincidence. You never know what's going to happen. All right. Pick your head up and, and talk to people instead of just walking by something or taking a picture in, of something interesting and walking away. Right. right. Say hi. And yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And be nice to everybody. Definitely. Right. hundred uh, percent. Did he tell like, you like how, what happened? Yeah, he couldn't, he couldn't find a, um, he couldn't find a job. I'm looking for the other um, picture here. Um, he couldn't find a job. And so his father says, why don't you just, he's, I'm going to go to New York because he lived in Chicago, came to yeah. New York. He was couch hopping through Craigslist. He was bartending. Wow. And he says, you know what? Screw it. I'm going with this sandwich board. I'm just going to make it. Make it. So that's, that's how you have to get attention. It's in the attention economy, right? Back to that, that point I was yeah. trying to make. So how do you capture attention these days? So he was in Chicago and he was like, yeah. I'm going to go to New York because I'll have better prospects there. Exactly. He was hustling and bustling and then yep. you know, grinding. He's not asking for money. He's asking for a job. And, um, yep. you know, like where he got hired oh that's it now look at him <laughs> uh, he's looking sharp you know no tie anymore because now he's at google so now he can yeah but wow what did he say like what he what was his first job he got from that did he get a job from that you think or you know he met so many people he got a lot of requests for sales of course of and course he's, he's an account guy uh, but, but, you know, cold calling, you know, Hey, yeah, you'd be yeah. great in sales and whatever, but he had a, a number, he's a really interesting guy. And, uh, yes, I think this did help him. His, his whole persona, he comes from a family of entrepreneurs. So okay. he has that entrepreneurial spirit. 
uh, and you know, the lesson here is don't be, don't be afraid to do something like that. Yeah, absolutely. That, I mean, that's such an interesting story. I could see that being a book cover too. Just that him and him, that picture you took, it just is the cover book. And it's like, look, just put yourself out there and do that. Yeah. You know? yeah. But how great that, you know, Facebook reminded me, I was able to contact, it was just, it was just a sequence of events that were just crazy. Well, yeah, and Facebook reminded me, but you took action on that too. You know, like it said, hey, remember this? You're like, you know what? That's unresolved in my brain. I got to <laughs> reach out and see exactly. what's up. Exactly. I still have the same email address. That's good too. So. Yeah, it was a Gmail. It was a Gmail. So that oh, yeah, was good. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Exactly. Wow. So, so attention economy, we've kind of chatted about it a couple of times. What, what are we talking about here? What, what is that? I mean, look at the world we live in, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, the, our attention spans have gone down. I think that if you've ever seen that video by Eric Qualman, the socialnomics video, if you haven't, look at I it. I used to work for him. Oh, you're kidding. What a yeah. great, I mean, just so entertaining. I mean, the stats go flying by you so quickly. He's but really tall. <laughs> oh, he is? <laughs> really tall. But, you know, we have the attention span less than a goldfish. I don't know how they measured that, but... Um, Wait, what'd you say? I wasn't paying attention. Was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how do you really capture attention these days? It's to earn it. Yeah. It's to be someone that's worth the attention. So that's why branding, you know, from an individual perspective as well as an organizational perspective, it's why engaging in social, engaging out there to, to, to be perceived as that expert and that resource, that go-to person Right. to be contacted. I, 90 percent of my business is through referrals. That, that, that CMO that, that I helped you know become a, she left our company and she went to another company and she brought me in. Wow. So, so it's, it's being that person that people want to pay attention to because we have fake news, we have you know it, it's crazy. Fake social. Yeah. Fake social. Fake everything. Fake so, yeah. So, so trying to be authentic and, and, and put yourself out there and you don't have to be you don't have millions of followers to make a difference in your world right. that, you work, that you work in. You know, I tell all of my clients, you know, don't get hung up on numbers. You, know, you don't need to have thousands of followers. A very engaged and attentive audience is better than, than a, a, you know, having millions of followers that don't care. Exactly, and you know what? Like, there's so many celebrities buy followers. Yeah. Um, I've just got a couple thousand, but they're like real people. And I've always been proud of the fact that they're like real people and they're, None of them are eggs. <laughs> eggs right, you don't right. have a photo. So the, yeah, so none of them are eggs. Um, and they're just real people. I love seeing what they're sharing and share with them, you know? Yeah, Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, so with, with regard to the attention economy, you know, when I teach social selling, I'm teaching these salespeople not to be overly selling. You know, you want to be that resource so that when you call, you know, when someone wants to make the phone call and they're ready to buy, they're going right. to call you. Right. Right, because they know you're 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 cool. You're not gonna hassle them. You're gonna tell them how it is. Mm -hmm. I had a cool conversation with um, uh, someone at Salesforce uh, two nights ago, and it was an amazing conversation. He 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 sold his company and he um, started at Salesforce because he wanted to help be like that customer internally that explains to other customers what's what, even if it's like you don't need this yet or you don't you know you're not ready for. A thousand licenses start with 200 which is a very risky thing to say when you know it exactly. but, but he was like this is what i'm doing i'm just i'm in here i'm just telling people what's what and it's like thank you and, and you know that you know maybe you don't sell that 20k deal but they might come back for that million dollar deal later because they trust you now exactly you're not trying to screw them over right i mean i tell clients sometimes like you know what i'm not the right resource for you but here's someone you should call yeah. Rather than saying, oh, yeah, I could do it. I could do it. No problem. <laughs> yeah, then not do it well. And then not do a good job. Love so I mean, people respect that and they, and, they, and they return the favor. Karma, karma is alive and well. Yeah, you know, not even like that spiritual sense, but just yeah. like, you know, you know the, the, mm -hmm. the things you do for other people, the, you end up building such a relationship and it's, it's almost, it's so much more practical than people give it credit for, you know? Yep. I mean, giving, you know, giving without any expectation always comes back to you. Totally, totally. So, who are you? How how did you become this guru of social marketing and selling? And well, take you us know, back to Little Jane. Little Jane, I don't know. I don't know if it goes all the way back to Little Jane, but uh, but I've been a <laughs> corporate marketing turned entrepreneur. <clears throat> I spent most of my career in in corporate, um, starting in publishing, advertising, BBDO. 
uh, then went to Bristol Myers, and then. But did Prodigy. you always start out in marketing? Like, did you know yes. you wanted to be in marketing? You know, in school, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, and my father. Yeah, I could see that. My father was begging me to go to law school, even you know, right up to the like, last couple of years. Um, but I, I took I took a, a couple of year, one year of law classes, and they were just so boring. You know, estates, torts, litigation. I was like, no, 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 this is not for me. And uh, but marketing was really my you know, marketing, advertising back in the early days when there was almost, I'm not going to say it was Mad Men kind of time because that was way back. Right. But before, all the, before all of the consolidation of, of advertising agencies into these big Omnicoms. And yeah. Oh, so I worked for BBDO, which I think is part of Omnicom now. Uh, and then worked in um, uh, Bristol Myers in their in-house um, in advertising agency. So Clairol, Bristol Myers products, you know, all the pharmaceuticals. <clears throat> and then... Um, I actually found Prodigy, which was the coolest thing ever back in 1987. You're talking which about was, the AOL thing? <laughs> well, it's not the AOL thing. Don't say AOL. They were our biggest competition. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so Prodigy was the largest online service back in the early days before AOL. Before AOL. Got it. Before AOL. Did you and, have a uh, number, though, in Prodigy? A number of, of members? No, no. Like oh. your username was a number? Uh, my username was HFDD77A. Yes. Yeah, I yeah, know. Okay. Yes. Uh, and that was HFD was Hartford was our test market in Hartford. So before in beta, I mean, I would literally log into the service in the early days, log in, go to the cafeteria, get my lunch, come back and the cursor would appear on the screen. That's oh, how, geez. that's how long it took for this to happen. 1200 baud modems. I mean, I'm really dating myself, but 100 baud. Okay. All right. Yeah. It was crazy. Uh, but you know what? It's the same stuff. It's, it's this, you know, we learned, if you, we learned so much about the industry, uh, and, and the same things that people are grappling with now are the same things that we were grappling with with regard to advertising, you know, clicking, you know, we had banner ads, people ignore them, right? You know, you know where they are, so you don't click yeah. on them. There's yeah. so many things that it's like, yeah, I've been there, done that. You know, it has to be contextual. Everything that you're right. doing has to be contextual. Um, so, so I find that I have that, that good experience and that helped me then move over into IBM, uh, when they were just starting their internet division. Wait, did you work at Prodigy? I did work at Prodigy for oh, wow. seven and a half years from, wow. uh, from my budget responsibility go from zero to 20 million over the course of what? a year. Yeah. So every salesperson was my best friend. A matter of fact, one of my best salespeople, here's another little tidbit. One of my best salespeople who did my software replication, my packaging, my promotions was the founder of Blue Man Group. What? One of my best friends back then. We, we were inseparable. So Matt Goldman, if you, uh, he's one of the original three. And he actually told me at their anniversary party a few years ago that if there was no prodigy, there would be no Blue Man. Wow. So the, the contracts I gave him financed their first show. And I was like, where's my royalties? <laughs> right. It's pretty cool. The, the contracts you gave him, what, was he like a contractor? He was like a- He was a salesperson. He was my salesperson who did all our software replication, our packaging for Prodigy. He worked for a company that, and he was my sales rep. And he and I were- Oh, oh he, yeah. So he, you got, you, right, right. So you, you bought so a lot He was my him. vendor. He was my vendor. Your vendor. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, so the, wow. The, so the commissions he made off of my contracts helped finance the first show. No kidding. Yeah. Well, the first blue man. That's so crazy. So he was it. He was, him and his two friends. Huh? You still keep in touch? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, not, I mean, he's a little busy now. Right? Yeah. And, and blue man can't talk, you know? No. So. And, and the most, that's the most ironic thing is because he's one of the funniest guys I've ever known. Right. He would leave three, ma three minute voicemails for me on just stream of consciousness. He was just the most hilarious <laughs> guy. So it's ironic that they don't talk. I mean, I was helping him write those posters in his apartment in the early days of the show. So it was- What, uh, what posters? Well, in the early days, they, had sh they, they would hold up posters with different things on the sign. I mean, in the early days- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah I remember some yeah. of those, yeah. So I was helping him write those posters up in his apartment back, way back in the early really? days. Really? Yeah, but again, back to the, back to the point of, you know, if I told my friends, uh, I'm going to go quit my job and go work for this blue thing, they thought well, I was crazy. It's <laughs> true. And look, I mean, true. I'm so proud of him. He's, he's one of the most smartest guys yeah. and guys that I've, I've ever met. Now, what, where was the original show at? In New York City, downtown. In New York. Okay. I, yep. I just, I experienced it in Boston, so I just imagined that maybe it was Boston, but so it started in New York and then it expanded yep. from there. 
Yeah, and he and they did they did every show themselves for the first year until he told me the story that Penn and Teller came to see them, and they said, "You guys are brilliant! Like you don't even have to be in the show to be in the show." And they looked at each other and they're like, "Holy crap! We didn't think of that!" And that's when they started replicating themselves. Right. You know, and 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 the rest is history. Thanks to Penn and Teller. Otherwise, they might not have scaled. They might have just exactly burned out. You do so many yeah. shows, and wow, then they start it's very physical. You know, my only my only thing to that story is I once looked into being a blue man, and I am I just I'm one inch too short. Really, I really need to be like five ten or something. Wow, I'll go to the chiropractor, and you know, maybe I'll wow. get an extra inch or something. But, but that's you know, crazy. That, well, you know, the, you know their instrument, the PVC instrument. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That was created from the PVC pipes from his company that he used to work for with. <laughs> And I said, oh, you got to call it, call it something really crazy. No, we're calling it the PVC instrument. I'm like, no, no, you got to call it something real. No, it's the PVC instrument. So they took all the scrap PVCs and made their own. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah. That's creativity. That's innovation. And it just shows you that's the stuff around you. You know, it wasn't like he sought out. He just, he was around PVC and around some other things and just, hey, let's make this thing up. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. Exactly. So anyway, so that was, you know, then I went to IBM. Um, to do a lot of different uh, aspects of marketing and uh, I managed their uh, global briefing center for e-business when e-business was out. So having my internet background, they kind of moved me around a lot. Uh, it was a great company to work for. Uh, and then I, I left- more Google. exciting than it, it, the brand it projects? You know, um, it's, it's changed an awful lot. Yeah. Uh, I, I felt that I had the opportunity to do anything I wanted to. I used to call it the fairy princess syndrome. Mm. Uh, you know, if I didn't have experience in something, I would set it again, back to networking. I would set it up. I would talk to someone and say, Hey, you know, this is really interesting. If you ever have an opening, call me. And I would get a call and they would let me do it even with no experience. Wow. So, so uh, things have changed and now you, now you probably need to have, you know, 99% of qualifications, but um, the mobility and the opportunity that I was able to have uh, at IBM was extraordinary. And I, I'm very grateful to have worked for that. It was like having another degree. Yeah, so, I, could, I, I could see the super benefit of like a flexible experience and being able to reach out to people internally being really yeah. powerful. That's cool. Yeah, and and, and as, as stodgy of an, of an image you think it has, mm -hmm. it was very entrepreneurial. I was actually always in all the emerging business opportunities. So I didn't work on the server business. I didn't work on the mainframe business. I was in the internet division. So it was right. very entrepreneurial. And I also worked in the life sciences um, uh, division for a while, you know, with the whole biotech when the genome was, was, you know, done. So, so having that experience of, of emerging business opportunities was very exciting. Right. You know, that makes a lot of sense Two different divisions, right? The server division needs to exude some confidence and, and maybe we don't really mess around because your server is always up and we're not going to be playing ping pong on your server, <laughs> you know, but the emerging business, it's almost like, did it feel like two different companies though? Because, you know, the other side, you need that innovation. You need that growth. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, the one time when I worked in the life sciences division, I felt like I was in a silo. Mm. Um, so that's, that's a, that's, that's a death knell for any company that you get in a silo. Uh, so you, you want to be able to have a broad reach across the company. So I felt like, um, if you have your fingers in a lot of different areas, um, then, then, you know, you can still make an impact. And even in those very traditional lines of business, there was a lot of innovation going on, a lot of smart, um, smart people that were doing some very cool things. Right. I love that quote. Silos are death knells for companies. I was going to for employees for employees. Yeah. It's for employees. And I put it down. And, I'm like, Oh man, that's a yeah. great point. So if, if you detect that, you know, then, so what was the answer to that? It was that, that cross pollination being able to be a part of different projects. And yes. Yes. And just reaching out and making sure that you're connecting with people. We used to have virtual happy hours, you know, cause, cause it worked. For, I used to, you know, work in different areas and different um, locations. And then it became, you know, IBM used to be, I've been moved. So I was moved to different, different, um, uh, positions, but then it also, then it became, I'm by myself because right. everybody worked from home and, and you didn't really have, so you kind of were in a stylist. You had to really make an effort to put yourself out there. We'd have virtual happy hours with people all around the globe. You know, you just five o'clock, we all get on a phone call and just talk, you know, you, you, you just want to maintain that interaction with your team because you can, you can get very isolated. 
Yeah, that's a good point. You know, we, we started to have one here and then it moved earlier and earlier in the day, but maybe, maybe we push it back out toward five and yeah, uh, yeah, just whatever you can do to bust through those silos. You know, how, how do you bust through that? Did something to be like, you know, if you, if you do something well, mm-hmm. share it. Uh, you know, there was a time when I remember I was just driving me crazy on, on an email overload and we can all relate to email overload. And I said, you know, there's some etiquette for, for email. Like, you know, if you're, if you're responding, if somebody says something and, and there's like 20 people on the, on the distribution list and you want to say thank you to the sender, you don't have to copy everybody to say thank you. Right. Just say thank you to the sender. Right. You know, oh, little that's a good things point. like, oh that's my a God. Really good right, point. Right. Reply so, all. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like I need that email in my inbox. So, so I wrote a whole bunch of, here's a top 10 etiquette and I just sent it to my team and then that got sent around. You know, if you, if you have a passion for something or if you can help with something, just do it and you get known for something. And again, that helps to elevate you and get you known across the company. Oh, absolutely. That's a really cool story. Do you still have that? I don't know. Probably not. I should look for it. That'd be interesting. Yeah. I'm sure it might be in the internet. Yeah, and it's probably still it probably still in, perceived. <laughs> still going around IBM right now, still floating right. around. Hey, you violated rule number nine, idiot. <laughs> People still do it too, right? Yeah, they do. They do. I love that. If you if you've done something well, share it. You know, on that note, you know, you've obviously done something well in terms of your marketing career and your thought leadership. Um, what advice would you have for like your younger self just getting into marketing? Um, and obviously everyone else out there listening, just getting into marketing or maybe, you know, work in their career. Yeah. Uh, n- number one is, you know, your network really is your net worth. And I, and I, and I hate to harp on that, but it, but it really is. And I find that, um, the millennial generation is less, less one-to-one and it's more texting. It's more, so, you know, sometimes it's, it's the pendulum swings too far to one end. Uh, you have to pick up the phone or you have to talk to people. You have to pick your head up from your, from your cell phone mm-hmm. to see that guy with the sandwich board, <laughs> right? right. You, so, so, you know, engaging with people because you don't – and, and not only thinking about what you're going to get from a person because you don't know who they know. So just talking to people, uh, that, that was something I think that was a success for me to be able to do that. I, I'm a natural networker. I think what I would tell my younger self, um, my problem is that – I am interested in so many different things. I, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, an eternal learner. And if I would tell my younger self, specialize. Specialize mm-hmm. in something and do it like a, a real niche, a real niche. I have a friend who um, is a roofing contractor. He's got a, com- a business and it's, it's a family business, but he could tell you every little thing about every bit about roofing. Yeah. And he is paid a lot of money to talk around the world about this. Everybody needs a roof. Right. And the technologies, you wouldn't think it's a roof, but there's technologies involved. There's so much involved. And you know what? That is brilliant. You have a niche. Right. So I would say specialize. That's really, really critical. And stay That's up to date. And don't get, don't get. Um, I like that. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't work on Tide detergent. I would have to work on something that's always changing. And I have been doing that, so that's good. But I would say specialize and network. Yeah, I love that. I love that. <clears throat> well, this has been really cool. Uh, like yeah, it's fun. All these different things going by. Um, you know, what's coming up? You got any events coming up? Any projects you're working on? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been asked by my clients. I mean, I do a lot of my, my training, my, my, uh, coaching on online and live classes around the world. Most of my clients are actually in Europe. What kind of and, classes? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's mostly in, in your, like I said, most of my business is referral. So I really don't even have a huge online presence that I'm just building right now. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but they've asked me to, to move it online so that they can scale it. So I've just moved my social selling course online to be able to scale it to, to very large uh, numbers of, of um, clients. So that's becoming available. Oh, um, cool. And that's exciting to me to be able to do that. And I'll be adding to that with all the stuff that we've talked about today with more, more of those types of, of classes. Awesome. So is that something we, they can sign up for now or should we? Just- yeah. Yeah. With social selling um, right now. Yeah. Where do and we- I will give you the link. Yeah. What's the link? Um, we, right now you can just go to my website, skandurogroup.com slash, um, social selling. Oh, cool. 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 Yeah. I'm on the site right now. Um, yeah. very cool. Yeah. And what we'll do is we'll put you know, the links into the show notes so people can click through onto that. Obviously you can just Google it too, but, right. um, either way, 
we're here for you all listening. That's right. Um, absolutely. So, okay, very cool. So you, you got that um, going up. Uh, get any events coming up? You're you're get your eye on. Uh, well, I might be going to the the B two B marketing exchange again in, in the one I went to. How you and I connected? I went oh, to one yeah. in Arizona. There's one in Boston in August. I'm still waiting to hear about those kinds of event um, in in uh, information. <clears throat> I might be talking at a, a Cisco event um, in May. Very excited again about their uh, their initiative for STEM, promoting STEM for younger younger women. Uh, so we'll be talking to a group of, of younger uh, women who are thinking about getting into STEM careers. So trying to motivate them to get into those kinds of uh, careers. So that's going to be fun. Girl, uh, Girls Power Tech is the name of their initiative. Ooh, I like that name. Yeah. So I, I love to be able to help, uh, you know, the next generation uh, to, to, to really get into this field. Oh, that is very cool. Girls Power Tech. I like yeah. that. Um, awesome. Well, very cool. You know, I, I guess, you know, one thing I just wanted to, you know, ask you about before we you know, cut you loose is that, that documentary. Cause I know it was a, you know, a big part of, you know, creating it and, and, and maybe just kind of, you know, share about what you did. Well, I had a partner a great partner. Um, and we did it together just for fun. Uh, he had become a documentary uh, filmmaker. Uh, he was a former Morgan Stanley managing director and, uh, he and I uh, had a had a boat. We had boats in the same marina, so we were just chatting. And <laughs> nice. uh, I said, you know, I had a great idea for a documentary because I'm. It's about the growth of the unmarried population and how hard it is for people to meet and to stay together. Uh, this was ten years ago, mm. and he's like, Nah, I don't think so because he'd been married thirty years or whatever. And I just kept sending him articles about the growth and how people are. It's it's just a crazy time. And so we decided to do it. And um, I'll never forget, he said to me, I said, asked him, how much money do you think we can make? And he said, assume zero or less. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I just want to do it anyway. Let's just be fun. So we, uh, so we shot 70 hours of footage, um, went all around the country talking to various uh, social scientists, you know, singles and married, divorced, whatever. Uh, and then we whittled it down to just an hour and 15 minutes of a documentary about how hard it is for people to um, stay married, to find people, to and, and, and the growth and the issues that are involved. So, wow. uh, and then my, my networking and social media, uh, you know, activities led to us being featured in, you know, the Today Show and uh, you know, CBS Sunday Morning and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So it was wow. fun. Yeah. So just kind of like a, a thought a project. kept driving you and you're like, ah, oh, this really needs to be made. Well, I, you know, when I had the boat, I bought a boat and, and I said, oh, well, this would be kind of fun. Maybe I'll, I'll create a boating club for, for singles. And then I did some research on it and I was like, there's really not many women that own boats, number okay. one. Okay. And, uh, that would be great, great odds for me. But, um, yeah, right, it would be. <laughs> but, uh, but it was just something that was topical on my mind at the time when he and I were chatting. And I said, you know, this might be something. And then it just kind of went from there. And it was, it was a great experience for both of us. Got it. Is it like something you can look up on iTunes kind of thing? It, you know, it's, it's, it's 10 years old. Um, it's, uh, you know, we, we took it down from the distribution. We had oh, a distributor. Did you? Okay. It was up on Amazon, but now it's, you know, it's kind of a. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 uh, the trailer is on my website if you wanted to see that. Oh, trailer. cool. Okay. We'll definitely check that out then. Yeah. That, but what a cool thing to visualize it and then make it happen. And then people responded to it. That, that's a Yeah. Yeah, it was Probably. fun. People don't care about anything else I've done in my career <laughs> except that most of the oh, time. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I, it, it's funny. They, they should, right? Like all these other things are just fascinating, the attention economy and yeah. all this. Um, so this has been awesome. What, what kind of links? How can people get connected to you? I know we threw out one link already about the site. Mm -hmm. Where, where yeah. do people go? Where do you want them to say hi? Uh, LinkedIn, you know, my LinkedIn profile. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm on Twitter. Um, I do Instagram, but not that much. Um, but that would be great. And then uh, if they want to sign up at my website and we'll keep in, keep in touch uh, on things like that, because I am totally focused on this whole attention thing. So uh, try, not only just capturing the attention of your prospects and your customers, but also harnessing my own attention to stay focused, to do what I need to do. Right. And I want to, I want to bring other people in the, in, you know, along with me in the journey to, to not get distracted because it's really important today. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Super important to do that. Yep. Um, very cool. Well, thank you so much for being here you, and, and I've learned so much from you today. No, I appreciate the opportunity. It was great to connect with you. Yeah. It, like, and so everyone else out there listening, share this with someone because I've got <laughs> notes front and back and, and I, 
And I know there's so many nuggets in here, especially that advice on the network for your career, specializing, staying current, um, understand the attention economy. And, and first and foremost, I mean, I, I can't wait to, to put in action some of the things around the, you know, the activation. I mean, the team activation, you know, how can we get everyone activated for their own benefit too, just to help, help your own teammates have some thought leadership. I mean, it's great stuff. Exactly. Yep. It really works. It really works. Yeah. 24 X that, yep. that, that counts as working for sure. It does. Yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you again. And thank you everyone out there listening. This has been the hardcore marketing show. We will talk to y'all next time.